Hello and welcome to Theory of Obscurity. I'm Kridoff. And I'm Apple Musk. And in this podcast, we delve into what popular culture has either forgotten or ignored. Media such as movies, books, TV shows, records, and anything else that we can send to each other as a YouTube link or a digital file. So, uh, Apple Mask sent me a TV play of the... Well, kind of technically it's a TV movie as such. Uh, of, of, but more of a yeah. British kind and not the kind you see on like a... CBS, the CBS movie of the week kind of deal. It's very, yeah. very different to that kind of thing entirely. And I sent... Um, okay, they're more classy. Yeah. <laughs> we are British. <laughs> yeah. And it's also rather more uh, surreal in various sorts of ways, a lot more sort of absurd. And yeah. um, I sent uh, Apple Mask a record. So shall we start with the record first? Because I think that's... Okay. Yeah, we'll start with the record first. So I sent Apple Mask the um, sources differ, but I believe it's either 1987 or 1988. 1987 might just be the recording time. But it's uh, Hanatarash with, uh, it's just called Two, and it's um, their second album, obviously. And it is a Japanese noise album of a kind. And um, so I, I know you have some kind of familiarity with, Japanese noise and stuff like that, basically through... Well, mostly, mostly through you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Was I was, was vaguely say. aware of it mm. before I knew you existed, but I recognised a lot of snatches and bits and pieces from old uh, Cridoff videos, yeah, surrealist montages and 3D uh, puppets going war. <laughs> yes. This was a this was a soundtrack to a lot of that. So um, I, I I suppose one thing I could say is could you uh, this is a bit of a tall order actually but could you try <laughs> and describe the overall sound of the yeah. of the yeah of the whole um, thing? I was like I said I was vaguely aware of the concept of noise music, mm. mostly in the metal machine music sort of mold of white noise and feedback that's just sort of ambiently screeching on and off for 20 minutes and then stopping this isn't that this isn't just ambient noise this is noises deliberately edited together and treated to very specifically sound the way that they do it's mostly screaming buzzing power tools white and brown noise uh, and things hitting other things the only instruments, the only actual musical instruments I could discern were some drums occasionally, um, a guitar, which is being dropped rather than being played, <laughs> uh, and a brief horn sample from somewhere or other on one of the tracks that very quickly disintegrates. Yes, yeah, I used that horn sample at the, on one of my earlier videos. I, I have no idea where they got that from, but uh, yeah. th- there's a lot of samples that have just... Yeah, sort of fanfare, isn't it? yeah. And, yeah, there was a guitar player on the um, recording. I, I just vaguely remember there was a quote from whoever it was sort of floating around. It may have been somebody from another quite famous um, uh, noise band. There's another band called... Uh, I think I can, I've never been sure exactly how to pronounce their name, so I, I feel like I, I, <laughs> I won't. But I know how it's spelt, and uh, basically the translation for their uh, name is basically emergency door or emergency exit or emergency stairs, something like that. And people in the know will know what I'm talking about now. But um, I think it was one of the people in that, because they they had like a guitar player, they had a drum player, Mm -hmm. and there were other people doing various other non-rock music things on top of that. So, yeah, he yeah. was probably doing the dropping guitar bits and mangling of various yeah. things, yeah. I don't know from the personnel on this record, except, um, obviously, Yamatsu Ai, as he was called at the time. Yeah. I don't know if there was anybody else on the record. Apparently there was. Yeah, there was, um, as far as I know, there was, yeah, it was just sort of a bit of a group effort because Hanatarash consisted mainly of I and also another guy called, I 
can't remember his name, so I'm going to go to Google and check it out. Hannah Tarash, live John search. Zorn. Oh, oh, John Zorn was the um, he was a uh, the person he played with on it was know, Naked the, City. Yeah, Naked City Torture Garden. Yeah, yeah which you see, is... I was making a joke, but uh, <laughs> kind of a late show, Alien <laughs> top joke. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, the guitarist was um, ah, it was Zeni Geva, Zeni Jiva, um, which is a band I've heard of, which are more sort of um, r- noise rock, and it's uh, Mitsuru Tabata, I believe it's pronounced. Uh, one of, one of these days, I, I am planning on installing that. Um, uh, what is it? The uh, the the Owl app that uh, people say, like, hates you and kills you in your sleep or something through all the memes, you know. That's uh, the language one, you know. What am I talking about? The Duolingo. Duolingo. Yeah, the people but that make that all is, the memes are about. That yeah. is the most esoteric description of Duolingo. <laughs> if you hadn't mentioned languages, I would never have got it. <laughs> I was thinking, this is, this, he's describing a nightmare to me again. <laughs> Well, they, 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 people have like made it into a nightmare, and really enough, it's just because it like frequently messages you about like uh, learning, like yeah. if you stop briefly, and like people have made extrapolated this whole thing about where the the green cartoon owl, that's like their mascot, like comes to like stares angrily through your window and tries smacking you about the face or something. There's all this stuff like people have done comic strips about it. I, I did I did use it to brush up my French a while back, and it does. He does nag you. Yes, yes, yes. That is what uh, yeah, it's based on. But, um, yeah, there's... Uh, I believe it probably was the guitarist guy um, from Zenigiva, Zenigiva, who was playing on that. And I think in the, in the live... There's, like, some uh, extraordinary live footage, of course, of Hanatarash. Because recently there was a, um, a video uploaded about um, their live gigs and them in general. And um, yeah, it's yeah, basically. Yeah, you pointed me to that, and I watched it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what, what was your opinion of that? Um, it's interest. This all grows out of punk rock, and it's interesting how punk rock gets more arty the further you go from from the Greenwich Meridian. Mm. American punk always struck me as being a bit more intellectual where British punk is primal and working class rage. American punk's always struck me being a bit more middle class and essay-ish and student-y. And then Japanese punk turns into this weird conceptual art business where you're not even making music necessarily, you're suggesting people scoop their eyes out (laughs) in five-year intervals. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, danger music. Yes, yes, yeah. the whole thing. Yeah, and um, there is like an, a nor- there was actually a conve- more, as, well, I say, relatively conventional punk scene. But again, yeah, s- sound wise, it was like much more extreme. Like I've heard some brief things, like uh, some EPs and things that were like distributed sometimes as flexi discs, sometimes or cassettes, and it's just like. Uh, they're like turning up the sound of the guitar to make it like sound as unpleasant and as insanely loud yeah. as possible, which is yeah, which was like happening at the same time as the whole noise scene. Interestingly enough, yeah. and it is interesting what you say also about um, American punk scene. How because uh, uh, I once read a interview with um, Lydia Lunch, who was of course the no wave thing, which happened just yeah. sort of just after punk did in Britain. And it's sort of like 78 up until about 80, 81. Yeah. And that was like Supported their... by Brian Eno. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Brian Eno, he recorded their, yeah, the big sort of thing, the statement album, even though apparently the album, uh, the artists involved weren't happy with the way the recording went, you know, did, felt it didn't capture them. But regardless, yeah, she, she actually mirrored your comments earlier about how, um, how she felt about, like, their equivalent of post-punk, essentially, no wave, uh, initially, uh, saying that, uh, I can't remember the quote now, of course, but it was something like uh, uh, British punk was this kind of 
working class yobbo thing. I think she actually may have used the word yobbo or yob or something like that. And it was all like a sort of American equivalent. Yes, yeah, she of that. probably did. Yeah. Yeah, and it, and she said no. This was more. So, this was, we felt completely disconnected from that. This was some whole other thing. And and I mean, obviously, it um, led into things. Bands like Suicide, who were like prototype synth pop in a weird way. You know, the little amplified sort of tinkly tinkly sort of drum machine but like this low buzzing electric organ yeah. and this guy doing a sort of a, like an elvis inspired rock and roll thing with the, the delay pedal gradu- occasionally being turned off and on you know yeah yeah so um the thing about um those live things um live actions is what they were called is that it was just people sort of i mean it would basically be about i himself and um, Mitsuru Tabata, he usually wouldn't be playing guitar. He would be playing drums or something. There's a couple of... The few couple of um, things that were recorded for posterity have him like just sort of off in a corner, just wailing away on a drum kit. And, uh, yeah, there's footage of him... Uh, of I, rather, like just throwing glass and things, just running about just throwing yeah. empty barrels and like pe- there's like tales of people having to uh, demand to sign waivers to saying that they wouldn't be they wouldn't yeah. sue people if they got hurt and things like that eventually they just wouldn't let Hanata Ash perform ever again ever yes yeah it was just too expensive they didn't have the insurance yeah exactly and um Eventually, there were like a couple of other Hanatarash things afterwards, but it was just I, yeah. and it was deliberately... Yeah, I understand that Hanatarash 3 was basically a solo project by I. Yeah, it was like a mixture of like um, recordings that were done previously but hadn't been released and some live recordings as well and stuff on top of that. And funny thing about the third um, record is that... Um, it was put out by a quite a well-known American noise label called RR Records, and um, they received um, a, t- a cassette tape uh, from I saying, "This is the basic track list. Um, I-, I want it to be something like this." And, and I think apparently I was expecting it to be. Um, sort of him to write back with suggestions says well i think we could ditch this track or maybe we could have this some different mix of that but basically because the guy behind our our records which is ron lessard he was so used to just getting tapes in the mail from people and as in as in a kind of yeah just put this out and kind of way he basically just mastered that cassette to (laughs) vinyl so you know it became a bit of <laughs> quite a bit of a surprise. It was this kind of language and also cultural breakdown there. She just thought, oh, okay, you yeah. sent me like a copy of a master. Possibly he was a little bit scared of I as well. <laughs> That's true, mind you. He 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 did uh, he does do uh, uh, noise himself, although it, it is not um, anywhere near the kind of you know obviously like most people, it's not yeah. sort of throwing yourself through a pane of glass, you know, defenestrating yourself or anything like that. Yeah. But um Slicing a dead cat in half with a machete. Yeah, oh god, yeah. That was yeah, that I mean I'm just glad that uh, the cat was like already dead. Yeah. Just... <laughs> That's what I was thinking as well actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They and well oh yeah, at another what time he there's all there's lots of famous stories, obviously. You can look them up yeah. for yourself on various places. But I will just briefly also treat um um I will go through the other things after that, the albums. So four was kind of along the same lines as two. Uh, it didn't have the, the held over tracks or the live tracks. It was entirely like a solo thing. Uh, it was more sort of, yeah, it was apparently from what I understand, it was recorded on a four track just within the space of a day. Sometimes I think the right audio sound channel failed to record. So some tracks are just left stereo channel only for whatever reason. And it's, yeah, again, it's very much on the lines of two, only it's more sort of, it explores, for some of the tracks, it's more sort of exploring a single idea for a whole track rather than editing and editing and editing and editing. Yeah. Uh, there's one where it's, it combines an already quite odd record, um, post-punk record by, uh, it's supposed to be a band called The Hybrid Kids. It's actually just one person called Morgan... Ah, 
oh, I can't remember. Hang on. <laughs> Again, I'm going to have to do a live search. Hang on. Hybrid Kids Record Discogs. If I can just find this. Yeah, Hybrid Kids and Morgan Fisher. That's it. it that was the guy, Morgan Fisher. Morgan and Fisher. he... Um, uh he did a like a very uh he did like a, a cover album of various quite famous songs some of them already punk songs of, of kind and one of them was a version of uh god save the queen of course by the sex pistols done in the style of pinky and perky and it's like he like he imitates like the sped up thing and like all the plinky plonkiness and is basically and then he at one point he goes into like um a pretty vacant as well and doing the same pinky and perky spit up voices is that is marvelous but basically i takes that already odd thing and then dubs over at random points what seems to be like a jet taking off or landing and then him yelling on top of it so kind of stuff like that yeah. uh you talk about track listings I've written, I've written down, and a lot of these, most of these, most of these notes were made while actually listening to the record. Mm -hmm. I've written down there are multiple tracks, but it doesn't really matter. <laughs> yes, some of them are just thirty seconds long and barely discernible from any of the others that are thirty seconds long, and a couple of them are seven minutes long. Yes, it's quite. There, there, there is one difference in that, uh, like a small collection of tracks towards the end are like some sort of bizarre live gig which is quite unlike the usual live things it seems to be uh at least i think it's recorded live but it's like it's just somebody who's very bad at guitar and somebody who's very bad at drums and then are yelling on top of it there's like they last about yeah. 12 seconds each or something do you remember those ones um <laughs> on on side two or side no yeah it's the line of notes on side no um yeah after a big long seven minute uh, piece called Gag Nuts Gum, which is seven minutes of intercut screaming in various tape speeds and static white noise. Then there's, yeah, these tiny little blipvert tracks, which are in the style of one of his later projects, Destroy 2. Yes. That's what it reminded me of. I, mean, he, he, I think it even includes the Fanku at the end. Oh, yeah, it does, doesn't it? I never thought of that, actually. <laughs> but, yeah, it's... Uh... So I've listened to that record a few times, partly because it's only ten minutes long, and um, and it's quite funny. And uh, if, you, if for the uninitiated listener, Destroy 2 is uh, is Yamatsukurai, or Yamatakurai, or whatever he's calling himself at that point, and um, Chu on drums. Basically, Chu plays the drums very, very loud and very aggressively, and I screams... <laughs> for ten seconds, and then and then says thank you. Yes, yeah. Some people, over and over again about forty times. Yes, yeah, some people claim he's saying fuck off instead. I I don't know, it's so, but it's so distorted. I just can't tell whether he's saying I, thank you or fuck off. And there's something to be I read. Think, into I that think it's fanku. Fanku. Yeah, it probably is. Yeah, but uh, there's a there's a marvelous little like mini bit of creative writing someone once did online to basically describe. The um, <laughs> yeah. the um, the album in general. Um, so it's like uh, uh, it's linked to. It was originally on some random website from two thousand and one, and since offline. But you can yeah. get to it through Wikipedia. Some website about short short album reviews, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, and it's sort of. Um, I was I was assumed that was you actually. <laughs> no, it wasn't me. No, it was just some mm. other random person. I always loved that bit. But oh, yeah. I might be able to find it on Google. Yes, if, yeah. If you can remember how it goes. 29 seconds later. No, I can't seem to find it, but... Okay. I know what you're talking about, though. Yeah, yeah. I'll try and put a link in the the various descriptions of the various uploads we have there to that. Yeah. I'll find it out and I'll put it in the links. So, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's on side no, as sort of Proto Destroyed 2 tracks. Yeah, yeah. First, yeah. The first side is side out. And uh, it's not as harsh as the second. Mostly because it doesn't have gag nuts gum on it. It's um, and this is stuff I'm writing as as I listen to it. It's striking how deliberate the chaos is. I is not just flailing at random; he's flailing in a controlled and structured manner. A little later, I said sometimes it sounds like being trapped in an office with roadworks going on outside. Uh, that actually reminds me of uh, a thing. Again, reminds me of a thing of um, somebody compared Japanese noise to something like roadworks happening in 
like main Japanese cities, like you're in an office and you hear all this yeah. stuff or happening. And again, that's another quote I can't remember, which is annoying. I'm gonna have to try and sympathy for the salaryman. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yes, it... yes. For, uh, you talk yeah. about salarymen. There is, of course, quite a famous, um, well, yeah, no, relatively famous, you know, um, in this scene, uh, a duo called the Incapacitants, who are both people who, uh, I don't know if they've retired yet, they may have, but they worked in the financial sector as, like, basic sort of office workers. Um, and they um, they actually named a lot of their tracks sort of like angry statements against the banking system itself and how they think their bosses are well, not so much their own bosses but like things in things in general in the finance world are all evil and stupid, which is interesting. It's a novel way of like um, yeah. <laughs> of blowing off steam. There's actually a clip yeah. recently uploaded onto YouTube from. It's not actually about noise, the documentary. It's just about sort of Japan and things in general, I think. But it's, um, it's yeah, they interview one of these guys. They actually have a camera crew follow him up to his um, office and he talks a bit and he says, I did try giving my boss the CD, but he didn't understand it at all. You know, it was just, yeah. <laughs> just fair enough, yeah. yeah. And, um, yeah. Um, there's a bit where I'm trying, where I'm clearly, while I'm listening to it, I'm still clearly trying to figure out um, what's going on? I start writing things like chaos in order to reach ultimate communion, and then I decide maybe not chaos at all because it's clearly so deliberately put together in a specific order. Yeah, and there is. Um, and then I think I crack it when I say it's not chaos at all; it's order without sense, <laughs> which is almost a complete definition of absurdism in itself. Yeah, that's, I, I explained I... it to my dad that way as well, and he said it was Dadaism for the years. Which yeah, yeah. That's that's actually a brilliant way of putting it. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. People do often talk about Dada in relation to anything odd on the internet. Sometimes yeah. they're kind of right. Sometimes they aren't. Sometimes they mean more things that are surrealist rather than Dadaist, because Dadaist, Dadaism yeah. and surrealism sort of look the same, but they have fundamentally different sort of ideas that they're coming from philosophies. Yeah. And um, but yeah, this 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 yeah, the Dadaist label probably does fit really well with this, and and a lot, some yeah in Japanese noise um, meanings definitely yeah. The record ends with a nanosecond of uh, moving to Florida by the butthole surfers. Just a, basically a you could just just about make out um, Gibby Haynes's voice before it cuts to I. What sounds like eyes smashing everything in the studio, screaming and wandering off. <laughs> yeah, there's um, <clears throat> that. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I keep like referring to other things that have happened in the yeah. noise things, but because it just just keeps reminding me of uh, yeah. But there is um, there's actually a, a track by a guy called Masona who named himself after Madonna. It's sort of a play on oh, yeah. masochism, masochism rather, and Madonna. And he recorded. Oh, it's his name, isn't it? Mas Maso Maso Maso. Uh, oh no, his name is that. Par- his name is actually Tetsuo or something, I think. And but he adopted the uh, name Maso as a kind of Maso thing. Yamazaki. Yeah, I think that's more his nickname. Oh, you're right. He was born Takushi. Takushi yeah, Yamazaki. yeah, yeah. He's ta- yeah. He had a, and um, yeah. yeah, and also honor. In, Jap- uh, in Japanese means girl as well, yeah. so it's like, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's one of the only Japanese words I know. Yeah, and it's, um, he uh, he does like a couple of, he did this same idea a couple of times, but basically where he you hear him sort of in a bathroom, and, and one of the tracks is more obviously meant to be a bathroom, because I think you can hear running water or something, and other, other sounds and all of a sudden he just goes starts screaming and yelling and stuff and then you hear because he's got recording it on a tape recorder a portable tape recorder you hear him like you belt out of a cubicle and out of the place and just continue yelling or something uh, i've never actually heard that track but one of these days i'm gonna have to try and track it down because both versions sounds are, sound absolutely amazing and <laughs> there's um there's also a version called uh, I think he the same guy did called self portrait, which is basically a recording of himself sleeping. He's just snoring away for about a minute, and that's about it. Yeah. Well, it sounds better than Bob Dylan's self portrait. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about that. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. One last thing I want to talk about is the liner notes, which are explicitly confrontational and misanthropic. Yes. 
don't listen this record. Kill all the noise artists, we love disco sound. <laughs> In trash talk at contemporaries White House, Coil, Current 93, Nurse With Wounds, Psychic TV. One thing I noticed after the fact is that the trash talk is, already, is, is, is aimed at Western um, noise and extreme artists. Mm. The likes of the Gera Gera Gig again, Soul Mania, get away with it. Mm. I don't know if there's anything significant in that fact. That, um, he's, that the liner notes tell White House and Nurse with Wound to fuck off and not any fellow Japanese noise artists. I don't know if there's any, any relevance to that whatsoever. I don't think so, because the no. Japanese noise artists in general sort of are quite happy to play abroad and, and things like that. But I, I will say that there is more... I think the Japanese had much more of a issue with some aspects of the early British noise scene, certainly, with all the, you know, the unpleasant implications of that, uh, uh, of which there are numerous imp- unpleasant implications. Um, the thing yeah. about Japan is the, J- the Japanese noise scene that seemed to be looking at uh, noise more of, a, more of a force of nature itself rather than just this incredible, incomprehensible, cosmic almost thing. I mean, to the point where they there's references to psychedelic rock and things. Uh, whereas with... Um, the, the, like the power electronics thing from the early 80s it's more sort of small grubby and unpleasant and sort of you get you picture people in like men in max sort of sort yeah. of stumbling about being evil basically whereas it's kind of like it's british early british noise power electronics certainly was like that and a japanese noise is basically the fear of a tidal wave, just an immense, huge thing, yeah. which, of course, has a lot to do with, obviously, the, the kind of uh, natural disasters that can happen there. And obviously, in the, in the yeah. wake of, um, of course, Hiroshima and um, Nagasaki, of course, which has, yeah. you know, led to all kinds of things. Whereas well, the British scene, White House in particular, are more about transgression for its own sake and smaller disasters like serial killers smaller scale disasters like serial killers yes there's more sort of a yeah it, it, i often thought that um small unpleasant violence rather than big cosmic violence yeah exactly and um there was one other thing i wanted to bring up um oh yeah there's um <clears throat> william bennett of white house in particular does get a lot of lampooning from the Japanese noise scene, which is amusing. Yeah. There's a, the Gero 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 they they, um, they did a, 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 like a seven inch single called William Bennett is my dick or something, which sort of gives you this extraordinary sort of a mental image, of course. Yeah. And then I think Hanatrash themselves then followed that up, I think about a little bit later with William Bennett has no dick. And that was a, <laughs> I love how childish that is. But it's, in many ways, it's against a deserving target, really. Um, so, what would you give? Uh, what What would you be your final verdict be on Hanatarash too? Then, I think any um, verdict or judgment I uh, put on a work of this nature is completely irrelevant. It is what it is, and there's nothing I can do. I can. I can hate it, I can love it. I admire it. I definitely admire it for for its relentlessness and for being exactly what it is. Mm. But I can't judge it, I can't give a verdict. It's it's not a it's it's not a relevant thing. Mm. Yeah. It's not it doesn't apply. So that was a uh... Hanatrash 2 and now this second uh, thing it was sent to me uh, by Apple Mask and it's um, it's uh, quite an extraordinary for some reason I don't know uh, simultaneously I don't know why it's not better known and yet I also do know why it's not better known because it's just so odd it's a TV film TV play what you call it it was in the um, broadcast I think in 1985 I think it was Something like that. I think it was yeah. the first series of Screen Two. Yeah, Screen Two was the um, the Strand, uh, which were a strand of like basically uh, roughly seventy odd minute uh, films, 
the shortest was about just over an hour, and the longest ones were just over two hours. It wasn't a definite thing, but you couldn't you could make Lance of Arabia or anything. Okay. Yes. Yeah, that makes. More it had sense. to be. A, it had to be a little over an hour, though. Yeah. 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 That makes more sense. But um, um, yeah. So this is called Unfair Exchanges, and. It's written by Ken Campbell, who, of course, I know a fair bit about. Um, if, even if it is sort of at a partially in passing, but I know I have a good idea of the basically his career. Uh, he started out um, doing these extraordinary, like extremely long theatre productions of things like the Illuminati trilogy and Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, things like that, which would go on for something like 24 hours in a, in a room above a pub or something. And yeah. he had, he, there were a number of quite famous people later on, of course, who became quite famous, who passed through his uh, company, um, theatre company. It was... Um, one of them is... Uh, well, funny, one of them, funny enough, was one, one half of the KLF, uh, Jimmy Corty, yeah. who did their set design. Equally... And, uh, um... Obsessed with the Illuminati trilogy. Yes, yes. And um, <laughs> there were just loads and loads of people, loads and loads of odd, uh, brilliant things happening with that guy. Uh, but um, The likes of John, Jim Broadbent and um, Sylvester McCoy, who beat him to the role of Doctor Who. Yes, I was just about to mention that, yeah, yeah. Which is, apparently they thought that Ken was too intense and scary or something. I think they said. Yeah, his audition was too disturbing, apparently. I'd love to see That's it. That's it. Yeah, yeah. We have to see it. Hopefully they, they have still have a, like a copy of that and we can, they'll put it on one of the Blu-ray or something, whatever. Yeah. But, um, yeah, the, the timing for this is quite extraordinary because it's like 1985. I believe it, it, uh, the, um, the continuity announcement at the beginning says it's the Julie Waters. And that, okay, so this is Julie Waters is in this. And it's so it's she's coming off directly according to the con- continuity announcement from Educating Rita, which was like a big international hit, of course. And this is like technically yeah. her next film role, even though it's like a TV movie thing, but it's, you know, it's a bit higher class than, as we said yeah. before, CBS movie of the week kind of thing. On one hand, it starts out being about uh, a single mother whose husband has realized he's gay and he's sort of gone off with somebody else but he's like still wants to support them and stuff like that uh, but right from the very first shot after the credits um you get the overarching theme is like presented right there in the background julia waters is walking down the road and right behind it is this huge sort of it feels huge uh, but it's like a lorry or a van, which is has the very familiar, at least if you were growing up um, during the 80s, of the British Telecom livery. So it's like um, yeah. that mainly yellow with uh, blue, uh, like cord, kind of vaguely yeah. futuristic sort of things. Letters full of dots. Yes. And um, I, I, I kind of... So this is odd because it, it, this is a film which doesn't have a lot of complete conclusions at the end. There's a lot of... Things are, you get obviously a good idea of what is happening, but it's not properly explained. Uh, they don't go on and like have somebody just explain everything that's happening. There's lots of people where people are explaining things about the telecom network and very sort of arcane things, but it's not, there's, it sort of ends at a point yeah. where. It doesn't offer any conclusions. No, no, and it's... Um, um, that's a 14 thing, apparently. They prefer to collate information and let the observer come to their own conclusions. Yeah, exactly, that's the whole 14 thing. And it was this was mentioned uh, by a couple of people on uh, Letterboxd, which is that uh, f- film review site, which I'm, I am part of. I occasionally dip in, in and out there, and I've ex- discovered some extraordinary things out of it. This is... One of those things that, like, it's made in, like, uh, the 1980s in a completely different kind of world, yet it's... At the time, this would have been just this absurd sort of fantasy, but now it's like this huge metaphor for 
everything that's happened over the last 15 or 20 years about AI mainly. It's like um, yeah. the gist of it basically, without wanting to give away too much, even though there's no proper ending to it, there's um, basically the telephone network has gained some kind of sentience and is sort of becoming like a kind of a, a brain. And like there's actually at one point there's a amended um, headline that they like stuck onto a, like an actual a production crew stuck onto an actual thing and it's meant to be an actual article which is sort of the telephone network is it now a brain or something like that I can't quite remember how it's phrased yeah but it's basically it's um, uh, I won't again I was going to say something there that might sort of spoil things a bit if you're going to watch this so I won't mention it but um, basically there's a lot of really really weird occurrences and, they, and the weirdness starts piling up but at never one point does it go completely full on like um the prisoner or something like that you know it doesn't go it, it's not like uh, no. fallout or anything but it's always very controlled which perhaps i think really helps the whole thing yeah. it gives this it's like it, it it gives this sort of spine of um yeah. straightforwardness while well, all these odd things like swirling around it yeah, it never quite breaks reality. But Ken could Ken could have done if he'd wanted to. He could have gone completely out of his tree if he'd wanted to. He's clearly making a de- he's clearly doing it delib- deliberately, keeping it grounded. Yes, the um, director is somebody called Gavin Miller, which is a name I recognise uh, from. Uh, apparently, he's direct. He directed a lot of things. Yeah, he's um, a safe pair of hands, really. Yeah, for yeah. Such as for such as Screen One. Yeah, there might also be an influence on it as well. There might be an additional yeah. thing. He directed the likes of the Crow Road adaptation and uh, Victoria Woods' Housewife Forty Nine episodes of Talking Heads. Yeah, which might be the link between Julie Waters and this. You might have like there yeah. might be some link there. Yeah, but it like is it just extraordinary that you have this uh, kind of incredibly forward thinking metaphor for artificial intelligence and the nature of truth and the internet in general and it's like this 1985 almost like kitchen sink drama on the on the surface starring julie walters that was shown on bbc2 in 1985 it's just just one absolutely extraordinary and um again i'm gonna try i i i don't want to like talk too much about the plot because it works better if you go into it relatively cold i think yeah but um it's it's like this. It really feels um, that the way the internet feels using it now. Basically, how she just it's up, the telephone network is is pre- presented as absolutely omnipresent. It's just everywhere. You constantly see British telecom signs of the time. Yeah. Like there's a point where uh, there's a phone call for Julie Waters' character in a pub, which incidentally has this extraordinary barman character who just wanders around going, talking about, but all the puffs and lesbians, please uh, go and... Uh, uh, I can't remember what it, what it was, but like something like... It's, 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 as if it's last orders, and he's talking about, yeah. oh, puffs and lesbians, last orders, please. And then from that, he, he like shouts out her name, and then this other bloke he, he he can't help but hear and then like he gets there's this mysterious call saying is mavis there because that's her that's her character's name and it says no he's not here and then then it clicks off goes hmm and then it turns out he has some sort of weird sort of british telecom like bit of kit on him like he's the bt worker it, it, it's, it's clearly like an actual thing like he i don't know what it would be here precisely but it's it's presented as like a sort of ominous thing, and is like is he behind it or, or isn't he? That's never explained. But there's all these little things that are that just appear there. And the fascinating thing about the um, there's this big long scene where Mavis meets a character who uh, explains uh, the initial stuff about the the network and about uh, phone freaking basically which is a thing that happened in the online the pre-internet online world where people used uh, things called uh, bulletin board systems which is something I knew of as a kid actually but I, I never got to actually experience it and because um, it involved you know obviously long yeah. phone calls you couldn't really avoid the concept of the BBS if you wanted to use if wanted to use shareware back in the day. Yeah. Big, 
because they always had a BBS address at the end of it. I never knew what that meant. Right, right, yeah, because I, I did, around about 89, 90, I read uh, you know, one of my dad's PC magazines explaining what the BBSs were. They were like basically mini internets almost that you dialed in through a standard dial-up modem and you would just access, it was like a separate server almost that you just dialed yes. into randomly. A lot of the talk in that particular uh, scene that sort of sets this concept up properly uh, reminded me of one of um, uh, Ken Campbell's many collaborators, actors, whatever you could call them, um, in his theatre company, mentioning how this like the anecdote was something like from the early to mid seventies, I believe, and he was saying about how he was talking about you know the telephone system is extraordinary because you can now we can like connect people to. Um, to people like uh, to somebody else in New York or somebody else and he wanted to try and contact Yoko Ono to ask her for permission to use one of her songs and they actually were able to like phone her up but um, like she, she turned them down for whatever reason of course because the thing is the, from the perspective of 1985 it's like how social media and things are now they're like utterly normalised and yeah. back then that kind of, yeah, and that kind of um, in, almost instant, long distance call kind of thing, phone call by then was now like uh, utterly normalised Normalized by that point. Because, I mean, only like 20 years or so prior, you would have to have, there were still people who would sit at a, like local exchanges who would like have to, you would actually call them and they were like physically plug in yeah. and plug out like cords you know that was like as late as the early 60s at least i think um yeah to that was what he was talking about in the course in that 70s anecdote how now it was all like automatic and electronic and that was the kind of thing that fascinated him so all these mm. things are sort of it, it's a it's a one like main thing he was interested in that he's finally after like a decade or so has come out as this extraordinary tv film it's worth pointing out that uh, it, the, the, the story is credited as from an idea by Ion Will. Yes. I haven't found yes, out much I... about Ion Will, but he was a contributor to the 14 Times. Yeah, Just yeah, like I should have mentioned Campbell. that. Yeah, I should have mentioned that. But yeah, apparently he came up with the basic idea for this. And But is it, it, I, I don't, again, we, I don't precisely know who Ion Ill is. Iron Ill, Iron Will is, and um, I mean, obviously, it's like an, a nickname, you know, it's I O N, as in, you know. I, I will mention one other thing. I will mention one other thing about um, David Rappaport is in this, um, yeah. who is um, quite, who appeared a lot on TV in the 80s, and here yeah. he is as a. Um, Another alumnus of the Campbell Road show, of course. Yes, yes. And he is playing like a, a, a neighbour in like, it's like a little, little sort of small um, flat share kind of thing, building yeah. they live in. And like the main person is like a TV writer who's always on the phone, like just screaming and yelling at somebody, uh, which of course comes into play later on. Yeah. And um, there's a, um, and there's this wonderful little thing when like she first um, goes into his flat where he, uh, this a, re a review, well, one of the reviews on Letterboxd actually describes it as a kind of like a Richard Brautigan kind of moment. Richard Brautigan being a very sort of hippie sort of writer who came up with the, these really wonderfully um, like offbeat, book, offbeat books. I actually have one of them. I've read one of them. It's a short story collection called Revenge of the Lawn, which I do recommend. And... Um, it, this uh, the thing he uh, Campbell comes up with is such a like a little Brautigan-esque idea. It's wonderful, even though it's like about something quite dark and cynical. And it's basically his uh, her neighbour, who I should say, uh, if you don't know who David Rappaport is, he uh, the most obvious thing about him visually, of course, is that he was um, uh, the what's the correct terminology meant to use at little the moment? Person, because, I think. Little person, yeah, I, I think He's it was a small that, yeah. Man. A small yeah and um they of course use like a different uh word not the m word but like another one which i believe is also uh not allowed and um 
they he walks through the flat and he's saying this is i want this place to be a shrine to things i no longer believe in so it's all these right on sort of things and now he's yeah. decided he's become very selfish as is the mood generally of the 80s of course which i thought was <laughs> yeah. just such a sort of simultaneously cynical and sad but sort of brilliant in such a weird way and um and that it's him. It's him that is sort of kickstarts things a bit more. And you know, there's other things that other ideas are sort of thrown at you. There's like a, how uh, the the telephone he used to, using the telephone directory as an I Ching, and then at the same time she yeah. happens to catch it. Like it's not a real top of the pops performance. And through um, regrettably, it does have a, a quick snatch of DLT at the end. Um, yeah, I should, it can't be I should I should mention yeah. Uh, through it is an, it is he does appear in a, a capacity that's easily edited out if yeah um, blinking you miss him yeah and um it's like a faked um top of the pops thing where um uh, it's about a a songwriter has written a thing for a band to perform called i i dial i ring therefore i am or i dial for therefore i am i ring therefore like. i am yeah yeah. And uh, yeah, and then she gets in touch with the songwriter, and other th- other things happen. Of course, I won't go on to the end, but it it really is one thing. It says uh, the continuity announcer says at the beginning. He just describes it as a thriller, but it's kind of like this. It's like sort of half that, but there's a bit of but there's a lot of science fiction. There's a there's a bit of horror in it, I would say as well. Uh, in particularly in regards to one scene, about roughly halfway through. And particularly the final moments, which are this intense sort of, again, it's not like full on, like sort of uh, uh, them dry bones craziness as in the the last episode of The Prisoner or anything. But it's like, it's just really intense and disturbing. And um, yeah, I won't describe it at all, but it's, it's extraordinary to see it's Julie Walters doing in this kind of intense sort of weird um, kind of thing. But yeah, it is. Um, yeah, it's it, it. It is. I can't really think of anything else to say about it without like you know, talking about major pl- plot points. Even through like nothing really gets resolved, but it is about the experience certainly. Yeah. About, like l- watching it and seeing all these strange things hinted at, and then at the end you're left to sort of try and work out what precisely you have from the things you do know. It leaves you no choice but to think about it. Yeah, yeah. Which is a which is a very fourteen technique. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I would definitely recommend this. At the moment, this is only available on YouTube through a, a VHS rip. And one thing I should say actually is something I did kind of picked up pick up upon, and it took the um, the one of the letterbox reviews to point it out is that this has really fascinating sound design. There's like sort of. Uh, and in t- as well as the standard sort of uh, sl- slightly orchestral sort of not orchestral but you know the c- kind of music tense music you would get in such productions of the time um there's kind of these little like echoey things like bits of distorted um radiophonic kind of um manipulations of telephone noises electronic noises and things bits like rec- echoed and looped at the end and things so yeah i do hope they do manage it because one of the people on letterboxd said that um they started a petition to get the bbc to release just lots of old sort of one-off films like that yeah like the screen two strand in general yeah they should do because it yeah because some of this is brilliant and especially this actually because it is I mean, it is extremely relevant in a quite an unexpected yeah. way, you know. I mean, somebody sitting down to it thinking, OK, this is about a single mother in the mid-80s and it's about Ju- Julia Waters is playing it and da, da, da. oh, it'll, maybe it'll be like uh, Adrian Mole or something. But it's like this just a just strange 14 times uh, inspired thing. So, yeah, it's... Um, so I do hope that when they, they do get to release this somehow and... Um, there's there is a bit of um fair bit of copyrighted music in it which would uh um, cause a bit of a problem the DLT thing obviously can easily be snipped out but um, I did there's a lot of yeah various things that would have to be dealt with and licensed first in this particular occasion but yeah I do hope that um, the BBC finally sees sense and that they do put out this stuff because they got they just have so much extraordinary things yet they yeah. they only they only put out clips of the odd thing. 
and, and it's like, well, that's your there's lot. A, you know, so. There's a massive library of um, one-off uh, dramas and television movies from the 60s, really, which is the, the earliest ones that still exist, all the way up to when they stopped bothering in the around the turn of the century. And if I was... If I was Director General of the BBC, one of the things I'd do is bring back the the one-off television players, Screen 4 or something. Yeah, exactly. That, that, I was thinking about that kind of thing, and I think that would be the first thing I would do too, definitely. Because, yeah, the, the nearest thing I think we've got to that in recent times is that short little thing by Jonathan Glazier that was like broadcast initially unannounced before Newsnight or something. It was um, The Fall, as in, not the Marquis Smith, but um, yeah. <laughs> uh, the... Um, the uh, <laughs> you know, if, you, if anybody here hasn't seen The Fall, the Jonathan Glazer film, you, you just, you, you should... I think it's still on, like, the iPlayer or something, probably. And you can, you can see it there. That's another... That's worth another look. And that's the kind of thing they should be doing more of, basically. I think they only base they only they only managed to do that because it had Jonathan Glazer's name attached. But that's uh, yeah, it was basically inspired by a photo Glazer had seen of um, Donald Trump Jr. Uh, going out hunting. Uh, basically, it's like a and there's a, a halfway through you very specifically see like a recreation, like a sort of a, like a nightmarish recreation of what that was. Yeah, so that's the kind of thing. It should be doing more of, definitely. Yeah, but I do recommend this wholeheartedly. It's the kind of thing BBC Four should be for. Well, one of the things, obviously, as opposed to being closed down. Yeah. Which is yeah, still what yeah. it's threatened with. Yeah, yeah. People seem to be more uh, concerned about Top of the Pops repeats, which is... I mean, I do like the Top of the Pops yeah, repeats, the, but soon they'll be running out of... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah and it's going to be the Tony Daughter era before long. People might stop watching. <laughs> yeah, they are they are into nineteen ninety now, as I, I think as, yeah. the, as of this recording. But um, yeah, that was um, um, unfair exchanges, and yeah, again, I really wholeheartedly recommend that. And I do also um, uh, recommend uh, Hanatarash two, which is um, uh, equal is strange to rather more. It's it, it, well, it's sort of as you say, it's sort of chaotic uh and yet controlled in a, in like a kind of a different sort of way as a, order as without a sense that's it yeah order without okay. sense yeah so there's two different order order where there is some kind of sense and order where there is none <laughs> yeah so i think that about wraps it up for this episode doesn't it yeah um links to what we watched and listened to can be we'll put them in the description of both the youtube and soundcloud uploads this podcast is also available through Podomatic, is it? That is what it is called. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I couldn't remember because there's different ones, you know. And apparently, as you said last episode, apparently you can hear it through iTunes. Yeah, Thanks we to think. Podomatic, yeah. We think, yes. So I suppose we'll be back in about two weeks' time with um, yeah. whatever we manage to drag out of the archives. But um, until then, bye bye. <laughs> Here, in the money markets of the city, is a miracle of technology the money dealers take for granted. You can make a telephone call anywhere in the world simply by touching a television screen. It's British Telecom's city business system, and it gives the dealing room at Lloyds Bank International the speed of connection that is vital in a business where time is quite literally money. Helping London stay at the heart of the world's financial markets. British Telecom is the power behind the... <laughs>